So I think we'd like to move on to this, this next uh, treasure, the, the treasure of joyfulness. The treasure of joyfulness. The Pali words uh, usually use the word PT in this context. Sometimes other words are used in different contexts. But in the limbs of awakening, um, the word PT, P-I-T-I, is mostly used. Again, this is a, it is a spectrum word, you know, it, it has nuances again of enthusiasm, of interest, of uh, happiness, of, it speaks to the capacity of our heart to be gladdened, to be uplifted. And it also holds the seed of a, a very gentle, appreciative joyfulness, celebration, contentment. Think about how much of this path even though we speak a lot about dukkha and we speak a lot about the difficult, the path is actually concerned with cultivating the lovely. It's cultivating the lovely. You know, our capacity for these qualities of heart that, that, bring, uh, that bring a smile to the heart, that gladden the heart, that bring enthusiasm. You know, I don't know how anybody sustains a practice at all when it revolves around just working on the difficult. I, I, I can't imagine how anyone manages to sustain that. You know, it's really pretty demoralizing when it seems so endless. But I do see that the path is really sustained by cultivating the lovely, because this is what resources us inwardly. It's what renews us. It's what brings that affectionate curiosity. It's what encourages us. It's what gives confidence. You know, this sense that, that those seeds of loveliness live within our own hearts, you know. And I know, I know people sometimes argue with joyfulness, you know. You know, we, we look out to the world around us when there's, so much pain and so much loss and so many crises, you know, that we're all being asked to address. And, you know, joyfulness might feel frivolous, might feel sort of superficial. Uh, some people come from backgrounds where suffering is actually seen as being somewhat more noble than joyfulness. Um, sometimes people think of, you know, joyfulness is going to be a kind of reward for all the hard work that they do of the, on the difficult. Some people don't feel themselves to be worthy or deserving of joyfulness. Hmm? Don't feel to be worthy or deserving of joyfulness. That somehow, you know, guilt or shame are much more familiar territories. Well, I would say that everyone is worthy of joyfulness. I would say that we, it is an indispensable ally on this path. It's an indispensable ally. This is one of our greatest treasures. It's our greatest resources that uh, renews our capacity to show up for the difficult. I know during the pandemic, I've done quite a bit of work and teaching with people who are uh, working on some of the front lines of the COVID wards. You know, recently a nurse in my own doctor's surgery, you know, said she'd come to the surgery after, you know, a year and a half of working on the COVID wards. And I, I said, you know, well, you know, how are you now? She said, well, I'm finally allowing myself to feel again. Finally allowing myself to feel again. That during the intensity of working on the wards where, you know, there was so much pain and struggle. She said she'd had to teach herself just as a survival mechanism not to feel. You know, in the Brahma Viharas, this other part of this extended family of mindfulness, compassion and joyfulness are seen as being indispensable to each other. You know, that an overexposure to the difficult, an overexposure to pain is actually exhausting. And you will see this sometimes if you teach people who live with chronic illnesses or, you know, a long history of depressive relapse, you know, that it, it's exhausting. You know, quite frankly, rumination is exhausting. You know, 
rumination is really exhausting. And when we become tired or exhausted, it opens the door to the whole spectrum of difficult emotional and mental states. You know, there's simply not the energy there, not the, the resilience there to meet the difficult. So sometimes we really know when to need to know when to be with something and when not to be with something. And if we are under resource, it's a time not to be with the difficult. Um, I don't find that there's very much learning that happens through being overwhelmed or flooded. I think we just feel battered. We lose confidence, you know, and I know in, you know, sometimes in contemporary mindfulness that the phrase of stay with something or be with something, you know, that was certainly part of some of the meditative traditions that I practiced in, you know, stay with it, stay with it, stay with it. Um, I don't think it's always good advice. I really, I really don't think it's something to turn into a command system. Chris mentioned earlier that there's such a thing as wide avoidance, and this is so. Not because we don't want to see something, but because this is not the moment to be with the difficult. And we don't need to really worry, you know, that if we take our attention towards resourcing ourselves, that somehow we've missed that one golden moment to actually be with the difficult. It'll wait for us. It'll wait for us, you know, it'll, it'll hang out for a while. It'll still be there when we've resourced ourselves. You know, we haven't missed that one opportunity to understand some pattern. I think if we're not resourced, we don't understand, we endure. We endure the difficult. And I don't think this is a skillful way to navigate uh, our way through the, the, the territory of dukkha or the difficult. Joyfulness is something that opens other doorways, other doorways of confidence, of appreciation, of celebration and we can't make ourselves joyful but we can learn to make room for joy we can learn to make room and space for joy and sometimes it's just a simple behavioral act of stopping and seeing wholeheartedly listening wholeheartedly cultivating that which actually does bring a smile to the heart. Uh, Chris. How do we protect our heart's capacity for compassion? By leaning into that which resources us. As Christina sometimes says, you know, maybe we should think rather than compassion fatigue, we should be thinking more of joy deficit. And we can sense the, the embodied nature of how we get dysregulated and scrambled and entangled in the face of all the difficulties and anxieties and overwhelms that are available to us just when we listen to the news or, or open ourselves to you know, the crises of this time, which are so immense and so intense and it's a very embodied dysregulation isn't it you know a lot of the you know ambient anxiety in our society we can just feel it in our bodies you know maybe personal but it's also societal and cultural and you know learning mindfully to regulate our nervous systems by leaning into that which resources us which nourishes us which soothes, which allows more sense of ground and more sense of the coherence that tends to emerge in our nervous systems when we do lean into that, which resources us. You know, this is, it's, it's indispensable in these times, isn't it? You know, isn't it the, the primary opportunity of having a mindfulness practice you know? and in a sense it's part of the intention of the first two three weeks of a mindfulness course is to lean into that which resources us and 
in MBCT, there's the Pleasant Events Calendar. Some of you will also know gratitude practices that are in some uh, mindfulness courses. And all of these are encouragements to give our attention to that which we can appreciate. And Christina and I have reflected over the years that, that often appreciation and appreciative joy is the portal into the constellation of qualities that uh, she mentioned earlier, the Brahma Viharas of kindness, compassion, equanimity, accessed often through uh, appreciative joy. Certainly when we're feeling burnt out, it's, it's hard to muster kindness when we're feeling burnt out, you know, and Actually, that's when we need to turn our attention to that which we can appreciate. In daily life, you know, looking for the blessings, looking for, as John Cabot's inputs it, the little things that are not little, their life, you know, the bird song, the autumn leaves, the sky, the stars at night, the ability to move, the laughter of a child, our favorite piece of music, the taste of food, these little blessings that actually are not to be disregarded if we want to incline our hearts and minds towards a greater sense of resource. But the Buddha also really encourages the cultivation of what he calls an inwardly generated sense of joyfulness. So a sense of joyfulness that's less dependent on external conditions. And appreciation is an attitude we can bring to our meditative practice. What's the difference between observing the breath and appreciating the breath? Feeling it and appreciating it. Appreciating our capacity to walk. You know, Thich Nhat Hanh says the miracle isn't to walk on the earth, on the water, it's to walk on the earth and to feel just the fact of being able to do that if we can. What a blessing that is. We'll miss that when that's no longer available to us. And to have that sense that actually we can inwardly generate through what we give attention to and how we cultivate that attention, we can inwardly generate a, a, a growing, capacity for joyfulness, for sustaining contact with joy, for, for having a sense that joy is accessible. Even if it's not always predominant, it's accessible. And it is interesting how uh, the Buddha chooses this word PT, which of all his words for joy, and he had a lot <laughs> of different words for joy and for pleasure, this is the word that's most embodied so he's, he's really encouraging uh, this in capacity to sense and appreciate uh, okayness, you know, groundedness, ease, pleasantness in the body. And I do think in our teaching of mindfulness uh, practices and meditation, it's so good to, well, in our practice and our teaching, to keep encouraging the attention initially towards that which is pleasant, that which is okay, that which is steadying, because that builds this capacity for a sense that this body doesn't just feel awful, you know. There are parts of my body that actually feel okay. Soles of the feet, sit bones in the buttocks, hands in the lap. To lean into those, such a helpful way of encouraging uh, you know, a capacity for an embodied, internally generated sense of joy. There's a wonderful quote from one of the Chinese traditions that says, write your sorrows in sand and your joys in stone. You know, it's recognizing that yes, sorrow is part of people's lives, but we tend to write our sorrows in stone. And this is a reversal, write your sorrows in sand 
and your joys in stone. Learning that capacity and lessening the capacity to ruminate over everything that is wrong and imperfect. Learning to, as Chris has said, to appreciate. And this again is, it doesn't have to be dramatic. You know, my, my young grandchildren lived with me during the lockdowns with their parents. And, you know, they were a source of tremendous joyfulness because of their joyfulness. Yes, it seemed like the sky was falling in, but, you know, they would laugh for hours about transferring water from one pot to another or moving stones in my garden from one place to another. You know, absolutely delighted. And I thought, yeah, making room for joyfulness, making room for joyfulness. You know, the Buddha once said that this is a path of happiness that leads to the highest happiness. And the highest happiness is peace. And I think that the peace that the Buddha speaks about is on many, many different levels. But it begins with really paying attention to the qualitative nature of our practice, the qualitative nature of our path. You know, when we turn up for our cushion or turn up for a class or, you know, are our teeth gritted? You know, are our hands clenched? Or do we think this is really a worthy moment? This is something to be deeply honored and respected and appreciated. And joyfulness is relational. You know, we're not talking about some sort of dissociated state in which all difficulty and sorrow has disappeared. It is a way of being a way of being present with the difficult. In one of the early texts, the Buddha encourages. Abide in joyfulness, free from hostility, even amongst those are who are hostile. Abide in joyfulness, free from distress, even amongst those who are distressed. Abide in happiness, in joyfulness, free from busyness, even amongst those who are busy. Joyfully we live those who cling to nothing. Joyfully we live, those who cling to nothing. And as Chris said, there are these, these dimensions, both of sensual joyfulness, the great appreciation for, for, for beauty, for the lovely, and the great appreciation of the sweetness of the collected heart and the collected mind for the sweetness of, of meta and care and sensitivity. Sensing into this qualitative domain and feeling how everything softens. You know? Life becomes meetable rather than again, something to be enjoy, endured. So I want to say another aspect that the Buddha points out, I think, quite skillfully. He says, in a mind of happiness, mindfulness finds a true foundation. Now, this can sound quite odd to hear. You know, when we look at the beginnings of our own path or, you know, we look at those who come maybe to your courses, you know, who, who, you know, who are encountering so many difficulties, you know, who are struggling. And we look at times when we embarked on our own journeys, often from a place of struggle. In a mind of happiness, mindfulness finds a true foundation. Maybe we need to give more attention to cultivating that mind of well-being. Again, it's not a denial of the difficult. It's not pretending. But it's actually really cultivating the climate in which mindfulness and tension can actually take root. You know, I, I often have a sense, you know, in eight week programs, when you have the pleasant events calendar, you know, just preceding the unpleasant events calendar, you know, um, you know, you've got a week with the pleasant events calendar, you know, and, and there's a lot of skillfulness in that. It, it teaches people a lot about coexistence, you know, that not every moment is miserable. There is that which can be appreciated gives people a taste of, of that appreciation. I, I think, and eight weeks, of course, what's possible in an eight week program is, is, you know, has certain limits to it. 
but maybe this is something that we um, need to encourage more in ourselves and in others, you know, creating that, cultivating the climate of mind in which we can settle and find some easefulness, you know, and a, a, a quiet gladness or contentment in what we are doing, even in the midst of the difficult. Joy and sorrow do not exclude each other. They live side by side. They live side by side. And again, what we frequently think about and dwell upon, to this does our mind incline. To this does our mind incline. Christian. Well, maybe just to, to give a moment or two uh, to invite you to, in this moment, sense the possibility of leaning into that which you can enjoy. So it might just be just to take a breath or two and see, can I bring an appreciative awareness to that? Or to Feel your body's grounding on the floor or the seat and to appreciate that. Or to look around in your physical environment and appreciate something that has a loveliness to it or that you're glad to see. Maybe you look out of a window and see something in nature. And just to sense the immediacy of this, this doesn't have to be far off. What's here now that you can lean into and be nourished by? How helpful to cultivate this as a daily practice of joy. <laughs> 